Thank you very much, uh, Lillian and uh, friends. Uh, I will just take uh, 30 seconds to tell you the story because uh, it was almost an invitation. Lillian has heard it so many times. It's a true story. When I was out in politics campaigning in rural Saskatchewan, um, the uh, chair was a crusty old farmer who had been introducing politicians a dime a dozen like me, and his introduction went something like this. We weren't politically correct, by the way, in those days. Thanks to Charlie on the old-time country fiddle for fiddling. He said, you're the best fiddler around these parts. Thanks to you, um, ladies, uh, great cooks around these parts. As I say, we weren't very particularly modern in those days. Good food and good music. Now that all the good things are over, here's our next speaker, Roy Romano. <clears throat> well, uh, I, I just simply want to give you a few reflective, uh, well, maybe not reflecting, some reflections and thoughts about this wonderful conference 10 years later, it just seems like uh, almost 10 days ago in some ways, uh, about this, uh, this experience of the Royal Commission report. Lillian, as you know, was a very, very key player and traveled with me all the time. In fact, in the pictures of the newspaper, we had the three of us, it was myself and Bob McMurtry and Lillian were pictured. They were saying the three commissioners and kept on identifying El Chigo unnamed with a very famous movie star as my co-lead co in the commissioner. And here she is still playing this very important role in healthcare in Canada. Well, I want to begin by saying the following. Um, listening to you, I have to begin by reflecting about my generation and my growing up in Saskatchewan. Like so many of my generation growing up in Saskatchewan, I supported the logic and the philosophy of Medicare inspired by Douglas's articulation of the case for publicly funded and universal health care. And his vision was, to my mind, empowering. We were, after all, going to give real expression to the values of fairness and equity. I did a very, very small part during the tense standoff, 50 years ago, by the way, this year, between the Saskatchewan government and its medical establishment, whose resources were buttressed by powerful forces from across the country and the United States. But Douglas's vision prevailed. We made hospital care and then Medicare a reality. And then after John Diefenbaker, Prime Minister of Canada, appointed Emmett Hall, a friend of mine, to the Hall Commission, the Saskatchewan experiment became the model, or the model, for the nation. And it's an interesting story about the battle within the federal government. Some of you will know it. But I happened to be speaking a few years ago at St. of X at the Allen, uh, J. Allen McKechn Lecture Series. And Sean Ryder, the president, said to me, Roy, he whispered, he said, I think Alan J. wants to say a few words after you speak. And he's never done this before, and he says, I have no idea what he's going to talk about. I was nervous because this is really an orator deluxe and a giant in Canadian political life. I finished my remarks and uh, Alan McKechn stood up and was telling us the story of the debate within the federal government on values and principles about the question of publicly funded Medicare, a big reform as it was then. And this is what McKechn said, and I'll just quote you a little bit about this remarkable story of political leadership. It comes right from the printed text of the lectures which they put out every few years from St. of X. McKechn said this, well, as the debate was going on in cabinet, federal cabinet, well, it would be unnatural, unexpected, for the provinces to remain silent. They took advantage of the divisions within cabinet by renewing their opposition to Medicare. Mr. Pearson felt the full brunt from the provincial premiers, the full brunt of their discontent on the subject of Medicare. Eight provincial premiers confronted him with complaints. The federal government had no right to force the pace of Medicare, and so on. So, McKechn said, it was in this atmosphere of provincial opposition and division within the cabinet that Mr. Pearson finally decided, and please note these words, I will underline them, that Mr. Pearson finally decided, Mr. Pearson finally decided that we would go ahead leadership, by the way, that we would go ahead with the Medicare program. And without his decision and decisive action at that time, because he finally made the decision, McKechn said, we may have lost the whole issue, end quote. 
perhaps the final vote in the House of Commons then, 177 in favor of Medicare, two against, tells the real political story of how much national Medicare resonated with the true values and the principles of Canadians. And from the time that I was elected to the legislature, way back these many decades ago in 1967, serving in the opposition benches, to my time as Premier for 10 years in Saskatchewan, and then eventually as Royal Commissioner on the Future of Health Care, I've always tried to heed these lessons and to learn from the heady days on the front lines of the Medicare wars, provincially and federally. And as I listen to you today, and as I contemplate, look back on my small involvement 10 years ago, what are some of these lessons, I ask? I think they're as follows. They deal with values, respect, evidence, innovation, and sustainability. First, values matter. Since day one, Canadians have repeatedly told everybody, pollsters, politicians, policy analysts, the same thing. Equity trumps income. Access to health care should be based on need, and the same level and quality of care should be available to all. Values matter. Second, respect matters. Public support for health care is not given freely. It is given in exchange for the commitment that the system will be there, including a reform system, for them when they need it. Respect matters. Third, evidence matters. We cannot build and sustain a durable, effective, and responsive health care system on guesses and unproven assumptions. We need to gather the evidence and facts about what works and what doesn't work and adjust our programs accordingly. And this means that it's almost always, always a work in progress. Over the course of my Royal Commission, by the way, the staff commissioned over 50 peer-reviewed papers from researchers from across the political spectrum. We convened panels of international experts across OECD countries to assess best practices on issues like user pay, cost drivers, and sustainability. And I won't stress, but simply note again, we held extensive cross-Canada public hearings, over 25 televised expert debates and expert roundtables took place. We organized three major research consortiums to report on challenges confronting the healthcare system. And we initiated also what may well be the most extensive process of public consultation and dialogue on any policy issue, on any policy issue in our country's certainly recent history, if not all of history, the CAPRN deliberative dialogue process. And we posted all of the results of these efforts on our website and invited, encouraged public debate and scrutiny about whether or not we were doing the right thing and headed the right way. Values, respect, evidence, those are important to remember. And now fourth, innovation. Innovation matters. And constantly renewing our healthcare system, of course, we adapt to changing science, new treatment modalities, shifting expectations and demographics. Every day there is something new we can learn and add to make Medicare better, that we should learn and add to make Medicare better, more responsive and more resilient. The healthcare system Tommy Douglas fought so hard to attain isn't the same as the one that Emmett Hall recommended, nor was it the one that inspired Pearson in Ottawa to table legislation establishing Medicare or for Monique Bejan to introduce the Canada Health Act, our charter of what the principles of our system really stand for. And it is not the same system that I was asked to review in 2001. It's changed, it's progressed, as it should. We must not, therefore, expend energy fighting, as I see it, to revert back to a 1950s private health care system any more than we should expend energy to maintain the status quo of the 1960s. Only someone oblivious to reality would fail to acknowledge how significantly the policy terrain has evolved and continues to rapidly evolve. 
or to realize that despite billions of new monies invested in healthcare since 2002, many serious challenges still face us. Which brings me to my fifth and final point. Values, all the ones I've identified. The fifth one, sustainability matters. And let me, let me say about sustainability. Financial sustainability depends to as much an extent as anything else to this issue, the decisions that government makes as to where it invests its money in the whole range of activities that government is charged to deal with. Those decisions impact on sustainability. So on the one hand, I'm heartened by some of the progress Canada's provinces and territories are making through the Health Council, the Health Innovation Council to improve interjurisdictional collaboration, support innovation and share best practices. I'm also pleased that they're working toward bulk purchasing of pharmaceutical products, considering it in any event, discussing it, and on a national, common national drug formulary, something which we recommended back in 2002 and I think is desperately needed. I understand a national vaccination program is also being discussed. All of these efforts and others can make our healthcare system more sustainable with this caution. But on the other hand, Ottawa must be there at the table too, as demonstrated by the McKechn quote. It must be at the table there too to ensure that these necessary and progressive changes apply to all Canadians all Canadians as a part of the nation building exercise which is forever the great challenge in a diverse country, small population country, large landmass country such as ours, and that the fundamental principles of Medicare are not undermined, that we don't turn the clock back to the days before Douglas, before Emmett Hall, and before Mike Pearson. We know there are important economies of scale and efficiencies that can be derived by working toward a more seamless and better integrated pan-Canadian health care plan with shared outcomes, goals, reporting performance metrics, professional licensing, standards and recruitment, and other questions. And as I pointed out earlier, there are many strategic investments we can make to keep people healthier longer, the upstream determinants of health care. I might say parenthetically something which we stressed in the report, but perhaps maybe on reflection, Lillian, we could have put more work into. What I'm doing now a lot with the University of Waterloo is trying to develop a Canadian index of well-being, a measuring stick about how we're doing on upstream care. So there are some failings and some new directions that need to be explored. I point this out because these are strategic investments that can only work to keep people healthier, longer, to reduce pressure on our hospitals and care providers, and to expand the use of everything that's available to us to improve the quality of life in this great country of ours. Let me close by saying that two things. First, that what made the Commission a particularly meaningful experience for me was my deep personal belief, I guess all the way back in those debates 50 years ago and back home, that Medicare is the single greatest symbol of our uniqueness as Canadians. What makes Medicare the quintessential Canadian program is that, is the con that it is the convergence point where so many of our values come together. That's why we called the report, Commission report, Building on Values. Medicare, in my judgment, and listening to you today, 10 years later, more than ever I feel, Medicare demonstrates that as community we can accomplish so much more than we could ever dream of doing as individuals or even dream as doing through individual governments in our country. We must work together. It underscores our basic fundamental belief that Canadian citizenship confers upon us rights that are based on the strength of our need and not the size of our wallets. And it highlights one of the new realities of a young century, that economic growth cannot advance at the expense of social cohesion or 
social cohesion at the expense of economic growth, the two go hand in hand. I said there was something else also which impressed me very much and I think should be stressed, and that is this uh, discussion 10 years later. Uh, hard to believe that it's 10 years ago. It seems like yesterday. But what is really heartening is to hear the new ideas and the young voices and the people who are coming forward to build on what was recommended in 2002. As I say, relevant or in need of change today, like everything else in the continuum of time. It was a great honor, it is a great honor for me to be here to listen and to listen to your points of views, but most importantly to see all of you and those connected through the modern day technologies embarking on this journey together with us. So I close by saying that I was honored, greatly honored, to help in a small way prepare a bit of a roadmap for a collective journey by all of us as Canadians, a journey to reform and renew our health care system, not only for its intrinsic value and worth, but also as a nation-building process and a nation-building exercise structured and founded on the fundamental values of our country. I want to thank Casper and all of you for coming out and taking part in this discussion and encourage you to keep on questioning and keep on debating and keep on reforming and keep on suggesting the changes because it can only get better as it will. Thank you all and God bless you. Do you want some questions? Do you want to drive any questions? Okay. I'll do it then. I keep on wanting to call him the commissioner. It's been 10 years, but that's what I called him for, you know, 18 months. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, please, Dennis. Now, the rule that I have is I take all the easy questions, and Lillian or Marshall or somebody will take the tough ones. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roy. Um, I want to make a comment and then put a question to you. Um, I was most uh, focused on your comment about the need or the benefits of strong leadership of people in public life because sometimes decisions have to be made in the interests of the society and uh, they aren't always easy to make because they sometimes uh, go against strong vested interests. So um, in Saskatchewan right now, in an effort to redesign primary health care, there's a three-point motto, if you like, and it's called patient-centered, community-designed, team-delivered. And the one part that's most difficult to make real is community design. And as I listen to, to Joe Gallagher, I'm so impressed with the way he and other First Nations leaders are actually mobilizing their communities to take control over the plans for future health care. And it strikes me... Uh, akin to the model we saw when we visited South Central Foundation in Alaska, which delivers care to all native Alaskans. And they've abandoned the use of the word patient. They call people customer owners, because the customer owners are actually the people who own the system and for whom doctors and nurses and hospitals and everybody works. And so my question to you, and, and I must say, Minister Matthews, I was really encouraged by your presentation to explain some of the things you're, you're doing in Ontario, and I know things are happening in other jurisdictions, to actually respond to the needs of particular groups of people. Those are communities. My question to you, Mr. Romano, is uh, sometimes we feel there's, there's a lack of strong collective leadership in this country right now in this file. How can we strengthen that leadership, and indeed get everybody working towards shared goals. Do you have some wisdom to share? Well, this is the time where I'll call on Lillian and, <laughs> and Greg. Uh, let me say that uh, Joe's presentation was excellent, and I don't mean to diminish it in any way uh, when I note that probably the most uh, uh, uplifting of all the many uplifting submissions that we received during the Royal Commission, and there were hundreds of them, 
Um, the ones that stuck with me the most were the ones primarily when we were in First Nations communities and Aboriginal communities where the philosophy that is expressed by Joe and the programs that are being implemented uh, were being advocated. There's no doubt about it. And there were many, many uh, wonderful stories, emotional stories. I remember one, I'm a little bit off topic. I think her name was uh, Anna Jane Hotter from, Nova Sco from Newfoundland. Uh, she came on about 7 p.m. at night. We started at 8 o'clock in the morning and just kept on going. And uh, her concern was about uh, a family member. It turned out to be a young boy, 11 or 12 years of age, was it Lillian, something of that nature, who had cancer. She had driven 140 miles to St. John's, Newfoundland, to make this just walk-on presentation. Uh, and... Uh, I, I, my first thought was that I turned over to Lily and I said, this is going to be a very tough uh, submission to hear, let alone to respond to. Uh, fighting back tears, she described how her plea was uh, the n need to develop in-home treatments and care for circumstances like her young son. Now, this is taken for granted, I know this now, and in some ways probably taken for granted when I was there as Royal Commissioner. But it just was equivalent to a, a hit right in between the eyes, the emotional and rational uh, argument that she advanced. And so it is with Joe in a slightly different circumstance. But now your question is, how do you get strong leadership? And I have no easy answer on this. Uh, I think that, you know, there's age-old debates about whether circumstances make leaders or leaders make the circumstances, and there are variations of that. I have confidence in this country, I'll close on this basis, that we are in a very serious debate. I'm out of the game of politics. I may not believe it. I have my own values and beliefs, but I'm out of the game. But there is a fundamental debate about what the values are of this country. And I think that that debate is very quickly focusing on whether or not those values are properly and correctly reflected in our health care system. And uh, in my experience, invariably, leadership arises from somewhere in those circumstances. Pearson in a minority situation, Douglas before that in a small province, Name the names all over again, Emmett Hall, Beijan, when she introduced the Canada Health Act, unanimous approval by the Conservatives, Mr. Mulroney's in opposition, they, they arise. Uh, I just think, I hope, well, I believe, I'll be blunt about it, that our values system in this country will bring to the fore leadership if we hear more of the kind of submissions from Joe, the kind of submissions I heard, the kinds of things that you're talking about as doctors and health policy people, uh, uh, and in some ways you're all leaders in that regard, political leadership will arise in this occasion again. If it doesn't, then this sparks an entirely different discussion where this country goes and how it will stand in the next five years or so. But uh, if I didn't have faith and hope, uh, I wouldn't be here 10 years later talking about the Royal Commission report. I still have much belief that that's what will happen. Sorry for being a little bit long-winded, but uh, brought back a reminiscence or two. I'll try to be very short with the other ones. Who's next, if anybody? Okay, sorry. Hi, I'm Ramona. Um, I'm a health I, ca I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm Ramona. I'm a health informatics student uh, at George Brown. And my question, or what I want to say is, a lot has happened in 10 years. There's been a tremendous amount of change. And I just want to know, do you think that the recommendations that you brought forward 10 years ago have stood, the, uh, have stood time? Um, do you think they need to be adjusted at all now, looking at what has been done and what still needs to be done? I think in many of the details, they uh, need revisiting or at least uh, adjustments. Uh, there's a, there always has been a very active body of uh, people who are very knowledgeable in this area, but it's, I think, never as active 
as I've seen it in this last little while, I could be wrong. But essentially, I believe that the fundamental propositions and positions which I advocated, take for example a Pharmacare plan. You can have the details of this change. Listening to Steve this morning, and he, he and I did an interview earlier in the morning, clearly the mechanics may be different than what I advocated. But the evidence is clear that if we can set up a, call it what you will, catastrophic drug plan, all of the benefits from a fiscal point of view and the benefits with respect to actual health on the ground individual people will be there. So I think those concepts are still as valid as they were when I wrote the report 10 years ago. We have a chapter on Aboriginal First Nations health uh, which tried to reflect the spirit of, of, of the comments that Joe talked about. Now whether or not the recommendation is on, uh, I think that probably is under some question and may need revision. But if you look at the topics, I think it is still quite valid. I admit I'm very biased, but I'm trying to keep an open mind uh, to this very important question. So the answer is, uh, in principle, yes, subject to some changes which uh, new science, new evidence, new people may bring to the table. And I think Lillian says this is it because you're giving me the hook. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.